Welcome everybody to Second Tuesdays at PERB. Good to see all of you and uh, we're going to get started um, right away. I just wanted to let you know that we are videotaping uh, this session and future sessions. Uh, we've got a request from several, several of you from last uh, month asking that we videotape and try to put it on our website. And so assuming our website will support a video, we will have it on our website as soon as possible so that those of you who have colleagues who were not able to attend uh, will be able to, your colleagues will be able to see it uh, at their leisure and as well as there are some of you who, there were some people who were here last, uh, the last session who said they could not make it to this session or I think it is in March that they won't be able to make it and so it'll be available also then. Uh, so I, I warn you that, <clears throat> I said I wasn't going to do this but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, I warn you that if you have any warrants out for your arrest, don't turn around. <laughs> um, what? Um, this is a large session and so uh, the question has always been whether or not we should split the session and have smaller groupings. If uh, I get some comment that the grouping should be smaller, then Mr. Higgins has agreed that he will hold two sessions as opposed to one. It could be on the same day, one would be at this particular time and then we would have one from 1.30 to 3, or we could hold it uh, on Tuesday and then have an extended session or the second session on another day, any day other than Thursday. So if uh, you have any suggestions about that, please let me know. To be sure, this is probably the largest that this, uh, this uh, room will, the largest number of people that this room will be able to hold. So uh, if we get more uh, uh, responses, we will have to break it up anyway. But I just wanted to let you know that we are open for suggestions from you. Uh, today we have two of our board members here and I want to recognize them. That's Ann Hoffman here and uh, then uh, Donald Was Wasserman, where are you? Okay, right there. And I uh, just wanted, these are our two board, two of our five board members and uh, thank you very much for coming. Let me introduce uh, our PERB staff. Uh, they're sitting over here. We have Erica Bolcom, uh, Kobe Harmon, we have David McFadden, and we have a new member, our supervisor attorney, uh, Lindsay Maxwell. And uh, so those are the people who write all of our decisions and orders, uh, proposals for the agency. And uh, so I wanted to put a face with, with the work that's done at our agency. And who are you? Oh, excuse me, uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Clarine Martin, and I'm Executive Director of PERB, and I have been Executive Director uh, short of a month, of, for a year, short of a month. So next year, next month, I will have been in this job for a, a year, and um, I've enjoyed it immensely. There was a request for a syllabus, and we thought about that, and we decided not to provide a syllabus for the classes because we wanted you to listen to the lecture as opposed to looking down at a syllabus. But we did offer or provide you with notes from last month's class, and we will provide those notes uh, after every class that we have uh, for, uh, for you to have for your records. And we'll also probably post them on our website. Um, I'm going to give this group of people some time to get in and then I will have Mr. Higgins start. So if you would just bear with us for a minute, I think. Uh, wait, let, me, let, me uh, let me also say this too, please, is that uh, when we send out the notices, please uh, respond. Notwithstanding the fact that you've been here today or last week, last month, we need to know how many people are coming so that we can make arrangements if we need to as to 
of the, the, the facility. Hopefully, you know, the fire marshals are downstairs on the seventh floor. Hopefully they don't come up here. <laughs> but uh, I think we're fine. I think we're fine. I saw somebody from the fire department here. But, uh, yeah, but... Uh, yeah, have four these, spots these over two. here. There's one, two, three, four seats over there. And there's one right, right here. Okay. Three up here. I feel like an usher at church, uh, right here. <laughs> That's a good idea. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Higgins did mention when I told him that we were having a few people, and uh, we'd already this morning at 8:30, we'd already had two people would come, and they had not signed up. And he said, "Oh, this is like church. Everybody's welcome. Find a room for us." So. This is like church, come on in. Church, synagogue, or whatever. I guess synagogues do the same thing. We have water over here, and um, so if you get thirsty. Here, you can get my stone. Uh, one over here. Started. For those of you who were uh, here uh, last uh, month, for those of you who were not here last month, let me introduce Mr. John Higgins. Mr. Higgins, as the flyer that we sent out said, is a former uh, board member of the National Labor Relations Board. He has also worked as an acting general counsel and an associate general counsel at the National Labor Relations Board. He's retired now, and he is a professor at Catholic University, where he teaches labor law courses, including labor relations in public in the public sector. Uh, he's also uh, the editor in chief of a major labor law treatise called Developing Labor Law. And most labor lawyers who deal, especially in the federal sector, have one on their desk. And uh, as I said before at uh, last uh, session, um, anything related to labor law, labor relations always, except for very few matters, always leads back to the National Labor Relations Board. So, Mr. Higgins, it's all yours now. Well, welcome back, um, and I'm uh, certainly glad to be here, and, and I really am thrilled the idea that I'm going to be a star. They're putting me on television. I can hardly, <laughs> I can hardly wait to tell my grandchildren uh, that they are short. Go to the DC curb site and they'll find me there. That's, that, that, this will be really, this will really be great. I don't know how long they'll watch uh, that kind of a show, but uh, at least they'll see Boobar, as they call me, uh, on the uh, on the television. Um, before I begin, I, I, I wanted to tell you something that happened right shortly after our last session, our session in December, and it, because it relates to some of the things, this something I talked about, and I, I just wanted to, I thought I'd re repeat it to you now. Uh, after the session uh, last, in, uh, I went to a, uh, a, a monthly LIRA meeting. LIRA stands is an acronym for Labor and Employment Re Research Association. It's a successor to an organization called the Industrial Relations Research Association. It's a worldwide organization, and it's made up of labor and management people. Most of, by the way, who are, are not lawyers. They're for real labor practitioners like you. I mean, for really people who are out there negotiating settlements, negotiating contracts, uh, settling disputes, and so forth. And they meet here, the D.C. chapter meets once a month, and they have a, a, a luncheon. And uh, they usually have very good speakers from the public sector and the private sector, uh, people from uh, international, uh, involved in international labor relations. I, I mentioned, mentioned it because, well, 
for, for two reasons. One, if you don't belong to Lira and you're practicing uh, labor relations and employment law, it's something you ought to think about joining. Uh, uh, it, I think it costs $40 a year or something like that. And they have, as I say, monthly luncheons. It is re they're really good speakers. Well, the, the session that I went to that I wanted to tell you about, uh, the speaker was a, a man by the name of George Cohen. George just recently retired as director of the Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service. And before that, he was a partner in a law firm called Bredhoff and Kaiser, which is a union law firm here in Washington and a very, very well-regarded, very well-respected law firm. George, among, other, among his clients, for example, uh, his, uh, the United Steelworkers of America, the National Basketball Players Association, the National Football Players Association. George represented all a lot of the really heavy hitters on the labor side uh, in, in labor relations. And then President Obama named him as director of the Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service. Well, that's a long warm-up to what George said. And that's what I want to just, to just tell you. Um, he was talking about his three or four years as director of, as director of FMCS. And he kept using the same word, the word that I, that I used the other day. And I, I just want to kind of repeat it to you. And he said, the most important thing that he tried to impart as the director of federal mediation was the concept of showing respect for the people on the other side of the table. That there's no point in tr thinking that you're representing unions well or thinking that you're representing management well, if you are not trying to build a relationship with that person across the table, even if she, he or she is, as my wife, who's from the South, would say, hateful, uh, um, even if they are nasty, okay, your job, what the D.C. government is paying you if you're on the management side and what the union is paying you for on the union side is to develop a relationship with those people. Because that's what that's that's what that's what you're, 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 that's what the, the employees want. The employees want a collective bargaining relationship that's fruitful. And and George kept saying that over and over again. I thought to myself, I, I got to repeat that at the next second Tuesday, because when someone is as as important as George and the whole labor management community spends a whole speech talking about that, I thought it was something I should talk to you a little bit about. So that anyway, that's it. All right. Um, what we're going to talk about today is part one unfair labor practices. And I, I, I'm going to have to talk fast if I'm going to try to get through what I want to talk about. What I want to talk about is the unfair labor practice provisions of the statute, okay, the statute that PERB enforces. I'm going to hopefully get all the way up to, um, but not begin, the discussion of collective bargaining law. Okay, what the NLRB would call Section 8A5, what PERB calls 101.617.04A3, A4, or something like that. I, 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 you know, I was with the NLRB for 47 years. I have all those citations down. I haven't been with PERB long enough to find it, know them all. But so what I'm going to try to get to is is talking about the unfair labor practice, all of the unfair labor practice provisions, except for the duty to bargain. And that will be February session, OK? Um, uh, before I begin, let me, let me just mention those, those notes that, I, that we prepared for you. Um, if you. If you notice, those are kind of a summary of what uh, we did like the last class. And you will get a similar summary uh, at, the, uh, at the beginning of the next session. So that hopefully when this program, this thing is all done, you'll have a, uh, a complete set of, uh, of what we talked about. And in addition to that, of course, you would have a, a binder which has the PERB rules and uh, regulations as well as the PERB statute. So you should have a, a kind of a good library that you can draw upon if you, uh, if you start to get involved in some PERB kinds of issues. All right. Um, if you look at the, very, the next to last item on page two of those notes, you'll notice a reference to, to timeliness. And those of you who were, were paying attention to the last class know that we really didn't discuss that at the last class. But because timeliness, or the statute of limitations, so to speak, 
is, a, is, a, is, is considered an aspect of, of PERB jurisdiction, or the jurisdiction that PERB has to operate in. Uh, I added it here, and I want to just spend a, just a few minutes talking about it, because perhaps for those of you who file unfair labor practice complaints, it may very well be the one place you don't want to make a mistake on. Okay? Anybody know how long the PERB statute of limitations is? What's the statute of limitations? Somebody said something. 100, 100, 120 days. That's right. And that's different, by the way, for those of you who practice uh, private sector labor law, that's different than the NLRB, which is 180 days. But it is an important 120 days because if you don't make, those, make that deadline, you, you're just plain, plain out of court. There's, there's just no way out of it. Now, uh, let me just, uh, the question though is, 120 days from what? That's the question. From the event given rise to what you believe to be an unfair Yes, ma'am. But what if they, but there are going to be occasions where you don't know about the event. What PERB says and what the statute, what, 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 what the PERB decisions say, it's 120 days from the date you knew or know or should have known of the unfair labor practice. Okay? Now, if the un alleged unfair labor practice happens to be a, a discriminatory discharge, an allegation that somebody was fired because he or she is for the union, that's usually pretty easy. That's pretty easy. The, the day the employee's given his pink slip and told to be on his way, and you've got 120 days. Okay? But sometimes, but there are unfair labor practices that are... Um, almost of their nature, are not so obvious. For example, subcon unilateral subcontracting. What do I mean by that? That means that the employer, for instance, um, uh, takes unit work and starts farming it off to somebody else outside of, the, outside of the agency and doesn't tell the union, and indeed keeps, a se keeps it a secret. Because if it's a secret, great. Then the union he doesn't have to bargain about it. The union isn't going to be bothering him and so forth. Well, when does that 120 days start? And 120 days starts from the date you knew or should have known. Now, should you have known? Well, if, if the very nature of the unfair labor practice is to keep it a secret, then the 120 days is going to start from when, it, when the cat gets out of the bag. Okay? When the cat gets out of the bag. So it's, it's, it's not 120 days that's, that, is, that you, you uh, in, in every single instance. Yes, sir? With that being said, do you have to prove that when you found out? Um, you may have to. Yes, sir. I, I, I suspect, for example, if, uh, if you file a complaint, um, and the, the, the PERB staff is going to ask you, gee, this happened back uh, six months ago, Al. What, what are you doing here now? And, and you are going to have to present evidence as to why you didn't know about this until something less than 120 days ago. Okay? So, yeah, yes, you may have to prove it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, ma'am? What if the union members know, but the union itself doesn't? Then it's probably it's something that you should have known. Okay? If it's, some, it's something you should have known. Now, it, 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 you could have a situation. And, 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 by the way, they've had cases like this at the NLRB where the employer secretly agrees to pay an employee something other than the contract wage. Pay them, maybe pay them less, or maybe pay them more, whatever it happens to be. There the employee is a, a unit employee, but the nature of that unfair labor practice is a secret between the employer and the employee. That's not the kind of situation that I was answering when you asked. Uh, it, but if, every, if, if pretty much everybody in the unit knew, and you didn't. I actually, but you probably aren't doing a very good job as a union representative anyway. You should have your ear to the ground out there. Right? Anyway, so it's, it's a, yeah, that's probably a you should have known situation. Okay? Um, uh, the, the, the key case, by the way, um, uh, on this uh, is, is a case called Hoggard versus Perb. Uh, it's a DC uh, Court of Appeals case. 
the citation for anybody who's looking, bothering, this is uh, 655 Atlantic 2nd, 320. And this involved a uh, school bus driver for, working for the D.C. Public Employment Relations Board. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the case, but it, it is, I think, probably the, the, one of the most important statute of limitations cases uh, under, uh, uh, under, under Peru. Okay? All right. Um, now, before I be, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about, oh, but, John, let me just stop about that. What's the rule of thumb? What should you get out of this? What you should get out of this is you, if you get a smell that the employer has committed an unfair labor practice, or if you get a smell that the union has committed an unfair labor practice, you better talk to your lawyer and don't just wait around. Those 120 days are that the meter is running, and you need to get to be thinking. You need to get thinking about filing a complaint. Maybe your lawyer may advise against it. Who knows? But, you, but don't just sit on your hands, okay? Once you get a sense that something's wrong, the meat is running on you, and you may want to get, get cracking. Okay. Yes, sir? Did you have to file, and if an employee, let's see if she has the right to file for her, or can they file on the federal level? If, the, if they're doing a violation case. When you say federal level, you mean with the Federal Labor Relations Authority or the NLRB? Yes. If, if, if the employee is a, an employee of D.C. government, you file with PERB. Okay. The NLRB has no jurisdiction over D.C. government, nor does the Federal Labor Relations Authority. Okay. Yeah. So you've got to go to PERB. Okay. Okay. Right. And importantly, by the way, you've got to go to PERB uh, on, uh, before you, in most cases, before you can go to court. There are some exceptions under the National Labor Relations Act where you don't have to go to the board first, you can actually go to court due to your fair representation. But as I understand the law with respect to PERB, you need to go to PERB first. Um, and uh, so you need to be on the, you need to be alert, okay? Right. <laughs> now, one of the things we've given you in your packet, because we are talking about complaints, sometimes, by the way, I will use the word charge, but that's because that's the term the board uses, the NLRB uses. I just can't get out of my NLRB bag. So if I use the word charge, I'm really talking about a complaint. Of, in in perb language, I'm talking about a complaint. What, does everybody have one of those in, his, uh, in front of them, a, a, a sample complaint? I'm not going to take you through this thing, but I just want you to, I wanted you to have one in your folders so that because many of you have probably, some of you may not have ever had one. Maybe you have such great relationships, you never had to, had to file an unfair labor practice complaint. Uh, so I thought maybe it would be good to have one in your folder. This particular complaint was prepared by the PERB staff. Uh, so it's right. Um, it's what it's supposed to be. The, 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 the only problem with it is it is, a, it is a, a bargaining case. So it is a little more, perhaps more complicated uh, than some of the other cases. For example, if you were filing a complaint about a discriminatory discharge, you know, a union steward got fired and you thought he was fired or she was fired because they were uh, being tough stewards. Uh, the, the complaint you would draft would be a little simpler than this because the issues are a little simpler and the things that you have to establish as part of the case are a little bit simpler, okay? But this is to give you an idea of what one of these things we're talking about, these unfair labor practice complaints, look like, okay? Any questions about them? Every, does everybody have one? Okay, good. All right. Uh, did somebody... Go back to Manually, or we still got to do it on the computer? Uh, you have to file it by a computer, right? Okay. No. No. Although, um, as I understand it, particularly if you are, uh, if an individual is filing pro se, that if, that is, if it is not a, a charge being, or complaint being filed by a union or complaint being filed by an agency, but it's just a rank and file employee who, who's got a beef against his employer or a beef against uh, the union, or maybe a beef against both. Uh, if, if they come down to PERB, the PERB staff will, will give them a hand, will, will help them um, uh, 
prepare uh, prepare, prepare the complaint. Okay, what we're going to talk about is uh, the unfair labor practice provisions um, uh, of um, the uh, CMPA. Um, and if you go to your binder, you'll you'll see that the unfair labor practice provisions are set out at 1.617.04. 1 1.617.04. Okay. And if you look at them, you will see. The first half of 1.617.04 is subheading A, and those are the unfair labor practice provisions uh, that regulate employer conduct. And then 1.617.04B are the unfair labor practice provisions that regulate union conduct. Okay? Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about 1, 2, 3, and 4 today uh, of A. And I'm going to talk about 1, 2, 4, and 5 of, uh, of uh, B. So we're going to, we, we will not get through uh, A or A, A5 or B3. And those are the, uh, the statutory obligations that unions and management have to each other to engage in good faith and collective bargaining. That's, that's for next month. That's for February. Okay. All right. Um, now, if you look at let's look, look at A one and look at B one, um, the district and its agents and representatives are prohibited from A a one interfering with, restraining, or coercing any employee in the exercise of the rights guaranteed in this subchapter. And if you go down to B, it is phrased very much the same way. So that both the employer and both and the union have obligations not to interfere with, restrain, or coerce employees in the exercise of their rights under this subchapter. Well, first of all, what does that mean? What are the what, what rights do employees have under the subchapter? Whatever. Anybody know what, what what rights do you have as an employee in the District of Columbia, as as far as PERB is concerned? Anybody know? Right. Exactly. Exactly. And those 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 rights are set out at uh, one point six one seven point zero one. It's the it's the right to join unions. And the the, the interestingly enough, this this statute, okay. It is, is very, very reminiscent of the National Labor Relations Act. A1 uh, and, and B1 okay, are almost carbon copies of what's in the, what is called A1 of the National, 8A1 of the NLRA and 8B1 of the NLRA. Okay? Um, there's a little difference, however. In both cases, the NLRA refers to employee rights under the statute. This refers to employees' rights under the subchapter. But the, there is a provision in the NLRA that is not in the, uh, the uh, not in CMPA. What did I say? CM, CM, I, I always get the, my letters reversed here. Um, and what that is is the, the under the National Labor Relations Act, employees have a right to engage in union activity, to engage in protected concerted activity, uh, for the purposes of mutual aid and protection, or to refrain from that. So the, in, 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 under the CMPA, they have a right to engage in union activity, and they have a right to refrain from engaging in union activity. The point being that the, 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 there is just as much right, the AFL-CIO likes to say, or has a phrase called union yes, union yes, the point being that in the District of Columbia, employees in the District of Columbia have a right to say union yes. They have the right to be for the union. They have just as much right to say union no. 
So one of the rights that this is referring to is the right to be against the union. It's just as much a right, and that same right exists under the National Labor Relations Act. The right to say union no exists. <coughs> but the difference between PERB and the NLRB is PERB doesn't have a provision in there referring to protected concerted activity. Under the National Labor Relations Act, you can engage in activities that have absolutely nothing to do with the union and still be covered by the National Labor Relations Board. Okay? And those activities are what's called protected concerted activities. <clears throat> protected activities are activities that, in which employees get together to work on um, uh, to improve their wages, hours, and working conditions. And concerted activities are activities in which two or more employees are involved. Okay? So if two employees walk into the boss's office in the private sector and they say, I'd like a pay raise, and the boss says, you two guys are wise guys. I, I don't like wise guys. I don't like guys who are always fomenting problems and worrying about pay raises. You're fired. That's an unfair labor practice. Okay. There's no union on the scene. These guys never even use the word union. Okay? That is an unfair labor practice because the employer has discriminated against them because of protected concerted activity. There is no counterpart to that in the CMPA. Okay. Now, what would happen? What would PERB do? I don't know. The simple answer is if you had that kind of a situation, <coughs> you should file. Perb will tell you. He'll tell you. you but but there is, that's one of the differences between CMPA and the NLRA. Just as an aside, for instance, uh, has anybody been re read anything about the, uh, um, the Facebook cases uh, involving the NLRB? Anybody heard anything about this in the paper? There's been a lot of well, good, one there's, there's been there's been a lot of publicity about these cases, and what they are is they are protected concerted activity cases. They're cases in which um, um, employees put something on their Facebook complaining about the boss, or a group of employees put something on the Facebook uh, their Facebook page complaining about the boss. The boss finds out about it and fires them. Why? Because they're insulting the employer. They're, it's abusive. They doesn't think that's right. And the NLRB says, that's protected concerted activity. Those guys are together trying to improve wages, hours, and working conditions. And their boss just discriminated against them for doing that, and that's an unfair labor practice. So this, this idea of protected concerted activity is not some ethereal uh, concept that you, you, you never hear about. It's as current as the Facebook today. And one of the most important cases at the NLRB, early cases, was a case called Washington Aluminum. Right, it happened right up here in, in, in suburban Baltimore. Um, employees showed up in an aluminum factory one morning, very cold, the heat was off, the employees refused to work, uh, they walked outside, in effect they struck. Okay? Um, the boss came in and said, go back to work, he said no, and he fired. And that case went to the Supreme Court. And there was, a, there was no union. There was no union at that plant. But it was a, so that was a protected, concerted activities case. Those employees were concerned about the working conditions, i.e. cold in the plant. And they were engaged in concert. More than one of them was out on strike. And uh, that case went to the Supreme Court, the board, and the employees won. Okay. So, the point here is, I, don't spend, I should probably spend more time on this than I should, but I, I, and you, I should understand this concept, and if you had that kind of a situation uh, and you weren't sure what to do, the answer is you should file with PERB. They'll tell you. They'll tell you whether it's an unfair labor practice or not. Okay? All right. Uh, <clears throat> Ma'am? Well, it's not in the statute, but whether PERB would say, we think, we think it's implicitly in the statute or not. Only PERB can tell you, and the only way PERB is going to tell you is if you file a, a char, a complaint. Okay? So if you had that kind of an issue, you, needed to, you need to file a complaint and let PERB tell you. That's the, that's the simple answer. Okay? All, right. All right. 
I want to take you through um, uh, um, s some uh, employer and union conduct that is violative or could be in violation of A A one. Okay, but here's a hit. It's very important you understand something here. If you notice that it says interfere with, restrain, or coerce employees in the exercise of their rights in this subchapter. What does that mean? What was what was what was the DC City Council thinking about when they when they wrote those words down? How are how are we? Some some of you are non lawyers, I mean maybe even lawyers, how are we supposed to know what's interference, restraint, and coercion? Who who who's gonna decide that? But these are very vague, very vague terms. Who decides? And the answer to that is PERB. The answer to that is the NLRB. Those agencies are what, what are often called expert agencies. They're composed of people who understand the workplace, who know what it would be like if you were a worker in a, in a, in a, in a, in a DC office or in a factory or, a, or you're a cop on a beat or you're a firefighter or you're working for WASA. They know what it's like to be out there, and they're able to say, gee, that, that kind of conduct by the employer, that does interfere. That does restrain and coerce. And that's why, that's why they have these expert agencies. Let's take an example. Interrogation. Anybody have, have any idea what the word interrogation means in the context of labor management relations? Yes, sir. Well, possibly, yeah. Okay. Anybody else have their thoughts? Discovery. Yes, over Discovery. Well, interrogation probably doesn't happen in the same way in in the D.C. government that it might, that happens in the private sector. And why is that? Well, because most of the interrogation cases in the private sector really arise in an organizing situation, where the the union's trying to get into the plant. They're, they're running an organizing campaign. So much of the D.C. government is already <coughs> organized that the kind of interrogations that normally come up probably don't come up as much. But what it is, is, by the way, it is, it is a, it's, it's a doctrine that the NLRB has that says asking employees how they feel about the union can be an unfair labor practice. That's what it means. Can be an unfair labor practice. In other words, the employee uh, is sitting at his desk or uh, uh, is uh, on his break, and the supervisor or the, uh, the manager comes up to him and says, Hey, Jim, uh, you know, the union's trying to organize here. What do you think about it? Okay. Now, what the NLRB says, and by the way, what PERB says, there are some interrogation cases on the books in PERB. There aren't many. But what it says is that that can be a coercive experience. Why? Anybody have any idea? Why would that be? Well, aren't people, don't people have enough guts to be able to just look at the boss and say, hey, yeah, I'm for the union, or no, I'm not, or, or why don't you mind your own business? What do you think? The employee can hold that against the, uh, the employee. Exactly, exactly. Well, let me, let me tell you an experience I had about, it was about 10 years ago in my, one of my classes at Catholic University. I had, a, I had a guy, we were talking about this very concept, and I had a guy in class raise his hand. He said, you know, by the way, this is a, a kind of a very good guy who thought of himself as kind of a macho guy, and uh, he was very, he considered himself pro-management. He thought that the NLRB, even though he was taking my course, he thought that the NLRB coddled employees and, and didn't really understand what, what, what the real world was like. Employees. So he raised his hand and he said to me, uh, uh, Mr. Higgins, I, you know, I, I don't understand this doctrine. I, I think it's the silliest thing in the world to think that an employee could be uh, coerced by uh, the boss. Just ask him how he feels about the union. I said, oh, I said, well, why don't we test it? Why don't we just test it right now? I said, why don't you stand up? He stood up. I said, I looked at him and I looked at him very serious and I said, do you like me? Whoa. 
<laughs> well, throws in his tracks. Throws in his tracks. I mean, he just turned. He, he just, he just, didn't know, what, breathless. He started the answer, and I said, put my hand up. I said, look, don't answer the question. Because, you know, I don't even care if you like me. That's not the point of this question. The point of this question is that feeling that you just had in the pit of your stomach when somebody who has leverage over you, I give you a grade, okay, leverage over you, um, asks you if you're with him or against him. Do you like me? Are you for the union? Either way, it's the same question, okay? And I said, that sickening feeling in your gut and that little trickle of water that's running down your <laughs> spinal column right now, that's, you just had, a, you were just coerced. I just coerced you. And, 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 I, it's, and that's, and, and, and by the way, I, I, I went on to point out, I said, this is just a lousy three-credit course in law school. If I flunk you, you still probably will graduate. Okay, we're not we're not talking about you being a relatively unskilled worker in a place where there aren't too many jobs around. And if you get fired, if that guy fires you, you ain't going to work. You got to go home and tell herself that you just lost your job and that we're, we're, we're moving on. I mean, it's 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 a whole different world out there. Well, anyway, the board doctrine is interrogation is not per se unlawful. In other words, every time you ask, and for instance, if you're, if, if, if you're working in, a, in, a, in an office in D.C. government and your brother-in-law is your supervisor and you're, you're over there uh, having Thanksgiving dinner and he looks down the table at you and he says, Hey, Jim, uh, uh, how do you feel about the way the union's handling these cases? Well, you know, that probably isn't terrible. That isn't really a coercive experience. So what the board says is it's all in the context. And one of the most important things is what the relationship is between the interrogator and the, and, the, and the person being questioned, and the locale. If you're working on the, if you're working out at your desk, and the boss calls you and says, uh, "Jim, come into my office, will you?" and he comes in, he closes the door, and then he asks you. That's a little more of a coercive experience. So, anyway, that's all I need to say about that. It doesn't happen that much, but I want you to get a concept of what interference, restraint, and coercion is. It was the job of the NLRB to figure out what those words mean in that context. And they did, and that's what they came up with. Another example, um, um, promise of benefits. Okay. Um, again, in, in, in the public sector, you don't have it as much as in the private sector. Uh, and it just mostly comes up in an organizing context. But where the employer promises benefits to employees, you know, if you don't, if the union, if the employees vote against the union, I'll give you all a raise. Or if you speak against the union with the people, I'll give you a raise. Okay? Unlawful? Every day of the week. Every day of the week. It's, it, it, it interferes with that employee's, uh, the promise of benefits interferes with that employee's right to say, Union yes or union no. The, the boss has no business doing that, is what the perp says. No business doing it is what the NLRB says. Another concept that in, 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 in this A1 area, or one, A1 area, okay, is surveillance. Now, we all watch cop shows, and we all know that cops engage in surveillance and, you know, criminals and so forth. But there is a doctrine in labor law called surveillance, okay, where the employer engages, is, is surveying or surveilling um, uh, the union activity of the employees. Mostly comes up in, unorgani in, unor in organizing situations where the union's having a meeting, at a church or a downtown area or something like that, <coughs> and it's scheduled for 7 o'clock, and at quarter of 7, all of a sudden, a supervisor's car pulls up. And out front, and he's just, he's just sitting there. He's just sitting there. Employees all see him. Are they coerced? Answer, you better believe it. And that would be, and that is another example of 8A1 8A1, A1 or A1 conduct, okay? 
even the impression that they're doing it. The NLRB just had a case not long ago where the employer passes out a flyer. There's an organizing situation. The employer passes out a flyer in which uh, on the flyer is, uh, don't sign one of these cards. And it's a picture of a union organizing <laughs> card, or me union membership card. The union was on the scene, but had been, been kept very quiet that they were trying to organize. There was no publicity about this. And the employer all of a sudden is now <laughs> flashing this card around. And the NLRB says, you know, that employer is giving those employees the impression that he's surveilling their activity, the impression that he's watching them, okay? And that's an unfair labor practice. I gotta tell you a story about a case I tried right before most of you were born, okay? <laughs> Down in Memphis, years and years ago, it was a union was trying to organize a burlap bag factory, okay? It was a, you know, it's minimum wage jobs, a dirty, hot job, on an air conditioned uh, facility, and they were, the union was trying to organize them. And they had a big warehouse. Uh, and uh, the employees, the warehouse was full of burlap bags, and the employees had dug out a big hole in the middle of the burlap bags where they would kind of go in and talk union. That was where they had little union meetings. And they, they, if somebody wanted to ask questions of some of the organizers, they, uh, the, the worker, the employee organizers, they could go in there and talk and so forth. So they're all in there one day, or a bunch of them are in there one day. And uh, uh, one of the women who was, was, was one of the union organizers looks up, and there up on the top of the ledge over the across, was, was the boss's son. And he's looking down and watching them. Okay? So we alleged, I don't, we, the, the, the government, the National Labor Relations Board, we alleged that that conduct was unlawful. It was, it, it was surveillance of the union activity. And um, the, the problem was we had to prove that the boss's son was a supervisor. He didn't have any title. He didn't have any rank and file. Uh, it was just a, he seemed to be doing rank and file work. But the employees knew that he was more than that. So I said to the woman, I'm, I'm examining her, and I said, uh, she described the event. And I said, well, who was that? She said, uh, Mr. Uh, Jones, Jr. And I said, oh. I said, what is his job? And she says, well, she said, I don't know. I think he's just a watcher. <laughs> he's just a watcher. That was enough to establish that he was an agent of his father, and therefore it was an unfair labor practice. But that watching, that watching of that union activity was a, was a, considered an unfair labor practice. Okay. Um, let me see where I am in my notes here. Um, I'm going to make my time my targets here. Um, let's let, let's just spend. I, I, by, by the way, let, let me just jump over across across the aisle, if you will, to eight to uh, B one. Okay, same language, same language as 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 uh, A one. Okay, only this is restrictions on unions. Yes, sir. If I know, if you know a, a union member, and he or she wants to be, want to leave the union to go into management, as a union, if I go to that individual and say, well, you know, going into management, this isn't the right thing to do, you know, you be at will, X, Y, Z can happen to you, you need to stay in the union, because the union, we can protect you, you have this right, you have that right. So, can't that agency passed you know, interrogation. Yeah. <laughs> that's exactly what I would, that, you are. You just asked the question that I was just going to ask. Is is it the same? Is is, is, is <coughs> conduct by unions under B one similarly unlawful as it would if it was by an employer under A one, which is what you're asking? Okay. And the answer is yeah. no. No. And why not? Who said no? <coughs> All right, why not? Why is it no? Because you don't have the ability to fire or have that. Right. Exactly right. The relationship is different. Okay? If, 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 the, if the man, so to speak, 
ask you if you're for the union and he or she can fire you for it, that's a whole different thing than if you, his union rep, there's not, you don't have any power over him, right? You don't have any power. The only thing you have is the power of persuasion. Okay? The only thing you have is power of persuasion. And there's nothing wrong with trying to persuade people. Now, if you start on, the, on coercive things like, we know where you live, yeah. <laughs> uh, 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 or, or activities like, like, like that. That that is clearly unlawful. That is clearly unlawful. So there, a union could be doing something like that. Or, or you know, you know, I have a good relationship with the supervisor, and if you start to act up at union meetings, I can have the supervisor sit on you. You know, I, the union rep, okay, that, that would be coercive too. In other words, you are, you, you are showing or suggesting that you are going to use your influence with management to do something bad against him. That would be an unfair labor practice. But the point is that the same kind of relationship, as this lady says, that exists between managers and employees and between unions and employees, it is a, it is a totally different uh, situation. Any more questions on that? All right, let's go to A2. Uh, uh, A2. Uh, I'm only going to spend a minute or two on this. This is, uh, uh, th this is a, a counterpart to a provision that is also in the National Labor Relations Act that makes it Ill illegal for employers and unions to have sweetheart relationships. Now, the sweetheart relationship does not mean that it's, there's something wrong with the employer and the union getting along well. Okay, you know, unions and employers get along very well in some very, very strong collective bargaining relationships. But a sweetheart relationship is where the union is in the employer's pocket. Okay. Now, interestingly enough, when Senator Wagner drafted the National Labor Relations Act in 1935. That's when it was first drafted. And he is considered the architect of it. He said, the most important provision of the National Labor Relations Act is A2, 8A2. And the reason why he said that, the reason why he said that was that when you have an employer who has some control over the union, okay, it really does undermine the concept of a free and an independent labor movement. I'm not talking about, I say independent labor movement, I'm not talking that you could be an independent union not in, in, unaffiliated with the AFL-CIO and still be a tough union, okay? Uh, I'm not saying that. But a free and independent, free and independent of the employer's influence. And if an employee, if the union doesn't, isn't a free and independent union, if it's in the boss's hip pocket, then that, that gives the employees the impression they've got a union when they don't. And that's what CMPA says is unlawful. That's what the NLRA says is unlawful. Now, yes, ma'am. So that seems like a big distinction between, say, a supervisor who's supportive of the union as it's organizing. Um, but my impression was if a supervisor says, oh, yeah, I'm all for the union while they're going through the organizing, that also could be considered a ULP. No. No, it doesn't. I mean, there, there, there can be, there, there is a body of, there a body of case law under the NLRA, and it would, I'm sure it would be a count, there would be a counterpart if, if Perp had such a case, where the, uh, where the, where the, the supervisors are actually out there trying to get employees to sign union cards, because they are, and it, by the way, I'm assuming that's an independent union, and it's not, not the boss's union. The, the, the the board or the courts have held and the board has held that that's objectionable conduct. That may be grounds to set it aside in an election. Whether it's an unfair labor practice, um, it, a lot would depend on the circumstances. Um, um, but <coughs> most of the 8A2 union cases came up early in the history of the National Labor Relations Act. The, the board doesn't get a lot of those today, the NLRB. And I, by the way, on, I went on the Axel, Bynes Axelrad website to see if there were very many cases under PERB, and I didn't. I found one where there was a, an 8A2 allegation. I'll tell you what it was in just a second. Um, um, but it can come up in, 
in, in unusual situations, situations that, that really are, are not, um, the, where the employer can get into it without realizing he's committing an unfair labor practice. Anybody ever hear of a quality circle? Quality circles? Well, there, it's a concept that came up in the in the in the '90s, uh, where employers were, were were trying to get employees to gather together uh, at the plant and talk about how they could improve quality, uh, or um, or they had employee committees who were talking about how they could improve production. And the question came up: Were these were these unlawful unions? You know, they didn't. They weren't AFL-CIO. They didn't say they were unions, but they acted like. If, if they act like a union, it's like that old proverbial duck. You know, quacking and walking and so forth. It is a duck. Well, if it's acting like a union, uh, for example, if it's negotiating with the boss about performance, you know, or about wages, or about making a better product, or having things easier at the plant. If it's doing that, if they're really talking like they're exchanging their positions, then it may very well be a labor organization or a union that could be an unfair labor practice. The board has had a few of those cases. The one case that I know PERB had, uh, and by the way, PERB dismissed this case, uh, involved a, uh, a group of uh, doctors from the uh, Public Health Service. This is back in the 90s. Uh, a group of doctors from the Public Health Service transferred over, and they were represented by a union. They transferred over to uh, D.C. General uh, on the staff of D.C. General, and they, D.C. General continued to recognize their union and paid them at the contra contract rate that they had negotiated with, with the public health service. That rate, <coughs> excuse me, that rate was more than the was negotiated with the union at D.C. General. So the D.C. General union filed an unfair labor practice charge with PERB alleging that, okay, that that relationship between uh, D.C. General and the, the union representing the public health service doctors was a, a, an assisted or a favorite or a sweetheart union, and th those employees should be merged with, in with them, and they should be getting the, the, the D.C. General contract wage. Okay. PERB says, no, okay. that's not what A2 is about. And more importantly, uh, we want, uh, uh, this is D.C. General just trying to honor the contract that these employees, these doctors, brought with them when they came over from uh, public health service. That's, I, that, that is the only case. Do you know of any cases? Do you know of any cases where 882 has come up? Yeah, there was a case involving the police department. Oh. Uh, a supervisor, uh, or, I'm sorry, an officer of the police department union became an uh, a manager from a different agency within the police department, and uh, the allegation that that was uh, gave him the employer control, and that was uh, dismissed. Okay. All right. Okay. I mean, th 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 there is there is nothing wrong with um, uh, supervisors being for the union. That's, that's not a sin. That's not a sin. Okay. But there can be a, if if they if they're out there. Uh, putting the arm on people to get them to support the union. Okay, that's the, the, they're not in the bargaining unit. They are the they're the boss, and they shouldn't be shouldn't be doing that. Okay, that's, so there's, there's a fine line to be drawn, and I th I think when an when a union person becomes a supervisor, I think probably in most employer uh, most employers do sit down and explain to them that their status is a little different now. Okay, any other questions on that? All right, let's talk about A3 and A4. Um, both A3 and A3 and A4 involve, uh, they're very similar to 8A3 and 8A4 of the National Labor Relations Act. A3 says it's unlawful to discriminate against an employee because of his or her union activity. Okay? And 8A4, or A4, says it's unlawful to discriminate against an employee because he or she filed a complaint, gave testimony under the act, assisted other employees in filing a complaint. Okay. So the, the, in both cases, the, the, the usual problem is a discharge. Okay. 
the usual problem is a discharge or some sort of disciplinary action. Uh, um, has anybody here been involved in a PERB case involving A3 or A4? Anybody ever been? Yes, ma'am. Did you have it? Did it, did it go to PERB? Yes. How'd you do? Not too good. Not too good. Okay. <laughs> well, you were you on management or union? Management. Oh, you're on management. Okay. So, okay. So the employee. All right. Um, 8A3 cases is the way it's referred to at the National Labor Relations Board are probably the most common type of unfair labor practice charge one gets um, at, in the NLRB. And almost always, almost always, they come up in an, in an organizing context. Okay? Um, and, and by the way, these are employees who don't have any, you know, in the private sector, so they don't have any civil service protections either. Okay? Um, what's involved in these kinds of cases? Well, almost invariably, there, there are cases in which the employer alleges misconduct that has nothing to do with their union activity. Okay? The employer I fired him because of tardiness. I fired him because he's a drunk. I fired him because his work is bad. Whatever it happens to be. And the issue for PERB, and the issue for you when you file, if you file your complaint, is establishing that. That statement ain't true. Okay, that it's a pretext, as the as the as the NLRB or as Perb would say, it's a pretext for what he was really trying to get at, and he was after this guy because he's a tough union steward, uh, he's a union organizer, or something like that. Okay. Well, how in heaven's name does uh, how in heaven's name do you prove it? Because you, by the way, at the NLRB, the general counsel is the prosecutor. He and his staff, they'll, they'll prove it for you. They'll go investigate it and prove it for you. How do you prove it? How do you, and who, all you can do is file a complaint with PERB. You've seen a copy of it right there. How do you go about proving that it's a lie? It isn't true. What would, what would some of the evidence be? What do you think would be the evidence? What should you be looking for? Character of the employee. Character of the employee? What, what, that's his, his employment history, yes. yes. Okay, okay. Um, anything else? Case law of which he's employed. Pardon, what's that? Case law of which he's employed. Well, yeah, yeah. Yes, ma'am. I think one of the victims is time. Perfect, yes, absolutely. That's right. What was the timing of this? Did this happen the day after the boss discovered that this guy was a union supporter? Or did this, this happen a couple of days after the employer and this union steward got into a big argument at a grievance meeting and the, the supervisor told the boss to go to hell and, uh, and, and the boss was upset and you can't talk to me that way. And then two days later, gee, all of a sudden his work is bad. Okay. Did that, is, that, is that what happened? That's the thing, that's another thing you look at. What else? Anything else? Disparate treatment. Absolutely. Oh, who said that? You and you. Okay, two people. Okay. Disparate treatment. Okay. <laughs> Have other people been tardy and weren't fired? Have other people had bad work? Are other people having drinking problems on the job and nothing's being done about it? Well, if, if, if those are the kinds of things that you're able to establish, then it starts to, you, the answer becomes pretty obvious. It, maybe it wasn't tardiness. Maybe it wasn't drinking. Maybe it wasn't bad work. Maybe it, the timing was perfect. Maybe it was union activity. Okay. One, by the way, one of the most important issues, no one mentioned, but it, it Ordinarily, it would not come up, I think, in the D.C. government, where people's union sentiments are pretty well known. But in an organizing campaign in the private sector, if there's one thing empo most employees don't want the boss to know, it's how they feel about the union. So it is a very important part of the government's case to establish that the boss knew they were for the union. 
Okay. Now, in the hypothetical that I gave you, where there was a, a screaming match between the steward and the and the and the and the manager, that's pretty obvious. Okay. But if it's an organizing case, uh, or, or or if the employee is is just another union member, doesn't do anything, doesn't he's not active in the union and so forth, and all of a sudden he gets fired, and you want to establish that that employee get fired for union activity, you got a hard, hard, hard road to hoe. Okay, because um, you you it, it, it's you, you've got to establish that 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 this was what motivated. The What if they, instead of going after you, they go after your brother, or your sister-in-law, or your mother? In other words, the boss decides, look, I can't be as obvious as firing that guy. He's a truly a troublemaker. But, you know, I'll teach him a lesson. He'll get the message, and I'll cover it up beautifully. So I'm going after his mother. His mother works at the same, at the same office the same office, or his brother or his sister-in-law works at the same office. If I can them, and I got a reason for canning them because she's always late for work, so I'll fire her and he'll get the message. And it'll hurt him. It'll hurt that family. And that's what I want. Illegal? Every day of the week. Every day of the work. Every day of the work. That employer is discriminating against an employee not because of her union activity, but because of the union activity or protected activity of people uh, that she knows. It doesn't have to be a relative. It could be a friend. Okay. The point being that the employer can't discriminate on the basis of uh, uh, union activity. Let's jump over to the other side. Oh, by the way, before I jump to the other side, 8A4. 8A4, it's just... It's, it's, we were talking about union activity, just take that out of the mix and add in filing a complaint with PERB, giving an affidavit to the, to the union to, to, for, for use in a PERB proceeding, uh, testifying in a PERB case, anything like that, that's protected conduct, that's protected by A4, and uh, um, almost always you don't have a problem with employer knowledge about that. So those, those are A4 cases. I don't know how often there you get an A4 case at PERB, but it is, it is, it is an extraordinarily important provision of the, uh, of the statute as far as PERB is concerned. At the National Labor Relations Board, when we got an 8A4 charge, we, we turned over every single rock we could find to, 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 to make sure that those employees were protected in their, in their access to the board. The board always views, views, that, views that as an extraordinarily important part of it, uh, protecting people's right to come to it. Okay? And I think the probably the same thing would be true with person. All right, jump across. When I say jump across, I mean we're jumping across from 8A to 8B. Okay? Um, and let's look at... Um, what it says about discriminatory discharges. Two, causing or attempting to cause the district to discriminate against an employee in violation of 617.06. Okay? 617.06, if you move over to Two pages, you'll see the statement of what it's about employee rights. Okay, it's the same, basically the same thing. And this is a this is a, a recognition by the D.C. Council, City Council, just as it was a recognition by Congress that the um, um, that the union doesn't have the power to fire people. Okay, but it can have an in, in, a very strong influence to get at its enemies if it wanted to get at its enemies. And that's what this particular provision says. So when a union attempt causes or attempts to cause, okay, so it's just as much an unfair labor practice if the union just asks the supervisor, hey, you, you kind of 
ride, ride herd on that guy, make his life a little bit miserable. We want to get a message to him and maybe even, maybe even fire him because we don't want him in our union anymore. And the supervisor says, hell no. I read six, I read, I went to the Higgins class. I went to second Tuesday. I know I, I can't do that. Yeah, okay. That's an unfair labor practice, though. He just attempted it. Okay. So a union asking to do it is just as much an unfair labor practice. Okay. Now, what, it, what I'm, I'm, I'm going to, okay. Um, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the duty of fair representation, but I'm, Sure I get to it. But let me just talk about the remedy. Let's assume the employer fires the employee for union activity. Private sector, curb, whatever, doesn't make any difference. Or let's assume the union attempts to cause the discharge of an employee and is successful. Okay? What, what can curb do? What, is, what does curb do? What do you get out if you file a complaint with them? What do you get out of it? Sir, make it known that they lost the rest of the case. Okay, okay. But well, what about the guy who got fired? What does he get out of it? And reinstatement. Okay. And what else does he get? Back pay. All of it. What if he? What if instead of while he, he's he's while he's laid off, he starts driving a cab for his brother-in-law, and actually he makes more money driving a cab than he. And he did working for uh, D.C. government. But he still wants his job back because he loves the pension. He loves, he loves working. Okay? Uh, what does he get? Does he get any, more? Does he get any money? Yeah, well, it depends. Huh? It's offset. Yeah. It's offset, yeah. yes, ma'am. Okay. He, you know, he, the PERB and the National Labor Relations Act makes the employees whole. They're not supposed to make money on it. Okay? They're not supposed to make money on it. Now, you can make an argument that there should be damages, and I think it's, it's often, that argument is often made by, by the union, by the, by the union movement, that there should be damages. But that's what Congress and that's what the D.C. City Council chose not to do. What if, while he was fired, um, his wife had a baby, and he had to... Uh, he didn't have, he lost his insurance. He's still working for his brother-in-law. He made a lot of money. Okay, he made, he made, by the way, he made more, a lot more than he would have made. In fact, it, he made enough to pay for that baby in the, in, in, at the, in the hospital and the, in the pediatrician, obstetrician. That, does that change your story? Yes, ma'am. No, it doesn't matter. Uh, what do you, anybody, she says no, he doesn't get any money, right? No, no, I didn't oh, say that. Oh, oh. I said no, it doesn't matter that he's made that much money. Yeah, if you are right. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Then we have to reinstate that health Right, right. And, and, and he, see, if he had to pick up that tab, if that, that would be one of his losses. Correct. As a result of uh, his, uh, he, he losing his job unlawfully. Okay? So that's, there's a whole huge, huge body of law which is called compliance law. Um, and if you in, end up in one of these kinds of cases, believe me when I tell you, your lawyer will figure it all out for you. So there's, there's, there's not a problem there. But the, but but, but the, the, there's another aspect to it too, and that is the, usually the, it does require that there be a posting of a notice in the workplace by the employer saying, "We will not discharge. We will not discharge people because for the union, we have reinstated John Smith. We've made him whole for any loss of pay as a result of uh, his uh, his, his uh, uh, as a result of our discriminatory acts against him." Okay. So that's the, yes, sir. One of the differences I noticed in reading the NLRB cases when uh, people are being stated is that the NLRB will order the employer to pay the taxes and the applicable taxes. Yeah. And yeah. Back to, the, to, to the board that the money's been done. Uh, generally, in, in, our, in arbitration, is how we handle our reinstatement cases. So if it, that, that particular provision doesn't apply to when our guys get reinstated and they get a lump sum. Well, you should you ask the arbitrator for it then. That's, I mean, that's, that's something you should ask the arbitrator for. And the, and the gentleman is right, by the way. For a long time, what would happen, employees would get a, a huge bunch of money 
maybe two or three years of back pay. Maybe it took that long to litigate the case. And they got a big bundle of money, and it all came due in one tax year, and they had to pay at a higher income, IRS rate. Okay? The board finally, and by the way, we in the general counsel's office argued against this for a long time. We finally got the NLRB to agree to an order that says, to the extent that this employee loses money, has to pay additional tax, that employer has to pay that to him. And says there's absolutely no reason, there's absolutely no reason why an arbitrator couldn't give that kind of award if he or she wanted to. And the only way they're going to do it is a, you got to ask them. you got to ask them. Yes, ma'am? Is the posting period for notices Um, the board does not consider the posting of a notice a negotiable item. Uh, and, the, and, and by the way, what they tell, what the board will tell you is, is tell you is, and I, I'm sure Perv have, would have the same same argument. Um, uh, you know, the remedies under CMPA or the remedies under the NLRA are not as meaningful as they could be. We ain't got much to, we ain't got much, and we're not going to give what we got away. Okay? So you've got to post a notice. And you can't put a, something in the notice that says I'm not what's called a non-admission clause. You can put that in the settlement agreement, but you can't put that in the notice. So the answer is the board does not negotiate that away. However, okay, if the union and the employer kiss and make up, okay, and they both walk into the NLRB office and they say, look, we've, we struck a deal, and our deal is to withdraw the unfair labor practice charge. Um, the board will accept that, and if that would often accept that, and if that means that may mean no post given notice, that may mean sometimes it means no, no back pay, or sometimes it means lesser back pay. But if if the board is satisfied that it is a true, a true settlement by two equally po powerful partners, then the board will accept permit a permit a withdrawal in that case. One question. Yes, sir. One question. You have a term employee. Most DC government employees come in term ten, and I've been. You got an employee that's been a term of ten employee for <coughs> two years, three years, four years. All of a sudden, he or she becomes heavily involved in the union, becomes a shop steward. Their um, their record has been excellent for the valuation, so their term comes up be renewed or let go. Management decides we're not going to renew your appointment. We're going to let you go. And you've been there for two, three, four years. Outstanding employee. As soon as you get involved with the union, we do not renew your appointment. Does an employee, everything else, I'm going to work on time, no other problem. Does that employee have a legitimate case that you bring to the union to file the purge. Absolutely. 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 And in terms of what happens when that case gets to PERB, you've met Ann, you've met Don Watson, and they're two PERB members. They weren't born yesterday. I mean, they're, they're going to figure this out. You, you, if you, the facts are as you describe them. They, know, they understand what's going on, and you'll probably win. Okay, if it's as bad as you describe it, okay? That's why you have experts working for it. Uh, I didn't finish what I wanted to finish. Uh, we have to do it next, we have to come back. Uh, I, can I, 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 I want to just touch very quickly on something, and then I, I will spend some time on it, because I think there are a lot of these duty of fair representation cases, and I, I, I think it's very important that uh, we spend not we don't just I don't just try to jam it in at the end of uh, at, at the end of this class. Um, let me just uh, quickly find my notes here. The duty of fair. Well, we've been talking right now. We've been talking about union and employer unfair labor practices, and we each time I pointed out to you where in the where in the Act CMPA or where in the NLRA you could find those unfair labor practices. There is an unfair labor practice called a breach of a duty of fair representation. And one, by the way, one could argue that it also is a breach of the standards of conduct uh, under the CMPA. 
But be, whether it is or it is not, the breach of the duty of fair representation okay, is, a, is a breach of the union's duty to represent all employees in the bargaining unit equally and fairly. Right. Now, if you go to the Railway Labor Act and looked up in a text, you would find a whole big chapter on the duty of fair representation for the railway unions and the airline unions. Those unions have a duty of fair representation. And so you go to the Railway Labor Act and you open it up, not word one mentioned in there. Similarly with the NLRB, if you go to the NRA and you start looking at the board volumes, you'd see a lot of references to the duty of fair representation. But if you went to the statute itself, you wouldn't find it. There's arguably, it is arguably in CMPA under the standards of conduct. Okay? But whether it's there or whether it's not, it's not important. The, po the fact of the matter is every union under a, 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 working under a statute has a duty of fair representation. Where does it come from? Why would there be a an, 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 why would it be an unfair labor practice for a union not to fairly represent employees when there's nothing above that in the um, um, in the statute? And the answer goes back to believe it or not, 1944 in a case called Steel versus Louisville and Nashville Railway, where a case went to the Supreme Court. It was a black employee working. Uh, I think. I, I'm not sure what, maybe it was the, maybe in the Brotherhood of Railway uh, Orders. I'm not sure. <coughs> no, no, it was, it was another union. Any event, he alleged that the seniority system, or was it the pension system? I'm sorry. But it was something that this was set up and it discriminated against black employees. Okay. And what the Supreme Court said was, um, it is, the union has committed an unfair labor practice because the union has an obligation to represent all employees in that bargaining unit fairly and equally. Why does it have that duty? It has that duty because Congress gave that union a license to represent those employees exclusively. So when a union accepts the, 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 the collect, a collective bargaining relationship, okay, accepts, it represents all of those employees. That's a lot, that's a lot of power. That's what the Supreme Court, that's a lot of power. And, 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 they, so, and, they, and they speak with one voice. That's why, you, that's why they call them unions. Um, and so if, it's, if we're going to, if we, the government, are going to give employees that, uh, give unions that kind of power, They've got to treat them. They, if they, and, only, and they only they can speak for those employees, and they've got to treat all those employees equally. That's what the duty of fair representation is considered. Now, let me just say, um, let me just let's, why don't I stop there? I, 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 I really don't. I really hesitate to drag, to try to kind of finish this out. We were supposed to be out of here at eleven thirty. Why don't we take a, any more questions about anything else? And wh what we'll do is, I promise you, we'll spend a, a, some time in, in, Jan in January, uh, me, in February, talking about the details of the duty of represent fair representation. Because the it is, it, by the way, it isn't as simple as that. You may say, "Well, does that mean I have to rep I have to do I have to represent everybody all the way up to the Supreme Court?" And the answer to that is absolutely no. It doesn't mean that. It just means that you've got to treat everybody equally, okay? If you think it's a lousy grievance and you want to say, get out of here, I'm not going to process that grievance for you, and you're, you're, your heart is pure, you're doing it in good faith, you're home free. Indeed, you may even ob have an obligation to say, I'm not going to process lousy <coughs> grievances, because if I process lousy grievances, I jam up the grievance arbitration machinery, and then the good grievances take forever to get to that arbitrator. So I may even have an obligation to say no. But we'll spend some more time on this because it is, it is, a, it is, a, it's, they, PERB gets a lot of what are called DFR cases, okay? And this is something you should all be very familiar with. Yes, sir. You have a, uh, this is a quick question. Um, a, a president that chooses not to investigate and then you, 
due to grievance, you actually go off to grievance yourself and win the case yourself. Do you still have recourse against the union? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I need to do a lot more about that. Let me tell you, there's a, there's a word that the that PERB uses, there's a word that the NLRB uses, there's a word that the Supreme Court uses, and the word is perfunctory. Okay? Uh, if you have a union that, uh, that acts like, just <clears throat> kind of acts like a union, but doesn't really do its job, it just goes through the motions. It just goes through the motions. Uh, that's not performing your duty of fair representation. Okay? You have an obligation to investigate. Now, you, if, when you investigate and you, as a union, you investigate that grievance, you find out you don't think there's any merit to it, you may have an obligation to just say no. Or you have an obligation to say yes. But you don't have a right to engage in perfunctory treatment of, of members of the union. By the way, it's not members of the union. Okay? It's not members of the union. It's employees in the bargaining unit. Employees, as you all know, don't have to be members of the union. They have to pay dues, but they don't have to be members of the union. Okay? So can you treat somebody differently because he pays his dues or, uh, and pays them grudgingly? All right? um, and do you have to treat him the same way you treat your brother-in-law, who's one of the best union guys in the whole world, and actually makes contributions to the union at the end of the year because he loves the union so much. And the answer to that is, yeah, yes. yeah, yes. yeah, exactly the same way, exactly the same way. All right. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm going to stop now. Um, I'll, we'll, we'll spend some more time on DFR next time, I promise. <laughs> and then our subject for the next class will be. Uh, the obligation, the, the, the duty to bargain. We'll be talking about what your obligations are as managers and as unions at the bargaining table. Okay? Thank you. Okay. I just want to remind you next time, please send your emails, let us know you're coming. And that way we can decide whether or not to get a larger room or split up the, split into sections. And also, if you have any suggestions, uh, feel free to send me an email query.martin at dc.gov and uh, so that I can consider whatever suggestions you have. And thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Ms. Martin. Yes, ma'am.